HTML, the history API is um, essentially what it is, is it lets us um, load new pages or update the URL with a new state uh, without actually having to go back to the server. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean we can do anything new. It just means we can do it in a more responsible way. So as John mentioned, um, it doesn't break the back button. Um, and if, you know, if I copy and paste a URL, uh, I know that someone else can load that URL as well. Um, so actually, this little presentation that I wrote um, is just using backwards and forwards um, and using push state uh, to update the screen. Um, so history API has actually been around for a very long time. Uh, you probably used this command once or twice in the past. Um, and this, is, this goes back to about 97, I think, i.e. 3, uh, Netscape 2. So history.go, then that minus 1 is, um, says I want to go back one place in, in the stack of my page history. Um, so what HTML5 adds is a new command to the history API called push state. And this um, takes a few arguments. Ooh. That's all right, we can talk around that. Um, it takes a, a state, title, and a URL argument. So you update it with a new URL that you want to display in the browser location bar. Um, in fact, if I bring up the URL um, and go backwards, you can see that that's changing. But the, uh, the browser is not loading in a new page. It's simply firing an event, um, which lets me know that the page has changed. Um, so I can update the page title as well. Um, and that first parameter is called state. That essentially lets me put a few, uh, pass a JavaScript uh, object in, which may have some information about uh, the state, maybe where, uh, what menus are open, or something about the page. Um, don't try and put in uh, huge amounts of data into that state. Uh, I tried to put in like H big chunks of HTML so that I could have that. Um, when, it, when people go back, I could just pull that HTML out. I think it only stores maybe a K or something like that. If you try and put like a large um, amount of data in there, you'll get um, an error. So local storage is a new HTML5 feature for, you know, if you wanted to do caching of um, pages, uh, which you probably do if you're, if you're using push state in the first place, because uh, you're probably doing it for speed, amongst other things. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, if I push a new uh, state to the browser, um, that updates the, the uh, the URL um, and the page title. If I then you use the back or forwards arrow, um, and uh, I'm going back into one of those states that I pushed, it'll fire this event, uh, which is called pop state. Um, so you can your code might look something like this um, to capture that event. Uh, you can pull a state out of the um, the event, and that would still have whatever you stored in it, which maybe is nothing. Um, I guess the thing to remember with once you go to, to push state and um, back and forth in the browser is that you don't actually get anything for free, really. You just get this new state event, but the page doesn't update. It's up to you to do everything uh, or anything you want to do with it. So, um, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about it in the HTML5 context, um, but it's actually it's JavaScript. You know, it's, uh, without JavaScript, it doesn't work. Um, and obviously, um, with that comes browser support issues. And of course, uh, we don't have the same support across all browsers. Um, IE, you know, as with everything IE, it's coming in 10, uh, which I actually tried to download IE 10 the other day, and apparently you have to install Windows 8 to even have it, which that doesn't seem like a web browser to me, but anyway, it's, uh, it's maybe a topic for another time. Um, so because of that, I guess uh, we're still in early times for HTML5. We don't have support across the board. Um, we see people working around um, the idea of being able to create this push state kind of activity. Um, and typically, people use the hashtag to do that. And I guess that's part of the reason I wanted to talk, do this talk today, was because um, if you are trying to work around this, you know, essentially do what push state's doing, but with hash, I keep calling this a hashtag. I think Twitter's just got into my brain too much. But with this hash character, um, you can kind of break the internet a little bit. And uh, there's been a couple high-profile companies that I think have broken the web, at least at the moment, slightly. Um, and as, as mentioned in my notes, the company that we're going to look at, oh, actually, we'll, so this is kind of what, you, what you'll tend to do, right? These days, you use jQuery. Um, so that's just an anchor tag. Um, instead of having on clicks in line, you'll use jQuery to detect a click on the, um, 
on whatever that object looks like and do something with that. Um, so, that, I mean, these hash characters go back a long way in, in the web, and they were, they're really a client-side convenience. They were I probably implemented initially to allow you to have a table of contents at the top of a long page and jump down to sections in the page. Um, so the thing that I only actually learned relatively recently about this anything after a hash in a URL, it's not just that the server is not going to do anything with it. The server doesn't even see anything after a hashtag. Like browsers don't pass that information through to a server. So if you have an app, if you have URLs like this, none of this stuff is getting to the Twitter server. Um, Twitter just sees all of these requests as this. Um, so they just see a bunch of people look, requesting the front page. Uh, they might be signed in users, so they might make a guess about or serve them their home uh, feed, or they might be new users, um, or they might be an uh, unsigned in user looking at, trying to look at one of these tweets. Um, so that's kind of an issue. I mean, apart from the fact that you're sort of dumping on people without JavaScript, uh, Twitter is now non-functional if you don't have JavaScript. Um, it's also uh, not really an efficient way to um, build an application. You know, every single request for a page is going to one single place, and then you're going to run some JavaScript to work out a bit more about what they wanted, um, and then maybe make other requests after that, or otherwise you're just going to serve a massive amount of data or JavaScript application, really, in Twitter's case, and uh, then you'll do something with that URL. Like, I think it's a bit like going to a restaurant uh, sitting down, waiting half an hour for the waiter to first come out. But when he does, he's got every single dish you might order already prepared, and he just asks you which one you want and gives you it. <laughs> like, it's a massive amount of overhead um, that you're giving people. Uh, you know, once, you've, once, you've, once the waiter's there, you, you get served pretty quickly. But I think you know, it's not good practice, it's particularly when you want to serve, say, like a single tweet. And of course, you know, there's a saying, and I think with airplanes, right, like the better an airplane looks, the better it flies or something like that. I think that's kind of a bit true of like URLs and websites. Like the better a URL looks or like if it look, starts looking like this, that's probably a bad thing. And it's particularly bad with the hash because, you know, it's implementation specific, right? And we're, we're all supposed to be writing websites where URLs aren't changing. We just, we keep URLs permanent for as long as we can, hopefully indefinitely. Um, and that's never going to happen when you have hashtags in your hash uh, characters in your URL because um, like the server's never going to see that, right? So if, if they went away from JavaScript, they, they get, you know, all of these URLs become useless. Um, and generally, search engines won't um, index hashes in URLs um, because they mean nothing to the server. But, oh, I don't have that here. Oh, so, but in Twitter's case, they're kind of following this weird semi best practice thing that, that Google decided we should all do, which was that you know, a lot of apps are building um, these, uh, you know, pages within JavaScript apps. So if you do have that hash bang uh, um, sort of uh, URL, Twitter, um, Google will actually request that page in a certain way that enables it to see what that page would have been. So it's not just, um, you know, like current URLs that people are trying to share on Twitter that have hashes in them. I mean, they're actually getting all of these URLs into search engines, you know, let alone all the social networks and things like that. And as I was talking about with that restaurant metaphor, you know, someone recently did a bit of research on how big some pages are getting on the, on the internet. And a single tweet page, which is 140 characters, right, like, is th uh, two megabytes. So it's something like, you know, signal to noise is pretty bad there. Um, and I think the thing with, uh, you know, if they had done it all push state, that still wouldn't necessarily um, change that, right? But I guess, you know, everything doesn't have to be the same. Like, a tw like maybe there, if you go to the main timeline on Twitter, they could have this fat application, JavaScript. But if you go to a tweet page, maybe it just has the, the tweet itself and a bit of styling. It doesn't need to actually not load in the full application. If you then went to a different part of Twitter, it could do that. Um, all right. So maybe, and actually, Twitter have acknowledged that that was probably a bad call, and, uh, and there are, uh, making amends now and they're moving their technology um, into this push state, right? And push state, you, you have real URLs, um, so if they do change their implementation, it doesn't matter. It's like technology agnostic in that sense. And, you know, push state has a great fallback, right? Which is, instead of writing your um, URLs like that with a, with a hash um, in them, you just have an actual URL. Now, 
if, you, if, you, if you've got a JavaScript app, you're gonna intercept that click anyway um, and stop the event propagation so you can display something directly on screen. Um, if they don't have JavaScript or if there's a problem with your JavaScript, then they'll go to the actual URL and you can then deal with that. So to me, that seems like quite an attractive fallback anyway. Um, so I'm a, I don't really totally understand how the whole hash thing became popularized. Um, so I thought I'd give you a demo um, of something I've built which uses uh, push state. Um, so this resolution is pretty average, so this might not be the best demo. So when I'm not doing client work, I've been working on a uh, car search engine, I don't know, for some reason. And uh, you know, if you're building any kind of search tool, you know, speed is a massive, uh, probably the most important feature other than returning relevant results. Uh, so, you know, search is a great um, use case for, for JavaScript and push state. So, my search engine lets you uh, look for cars um, that are available for sale. Uh, so, this is the demo, um, demo version running on uh, my laptop with some demo data. Um, but we'll have a look. So, I'll do a search here for an 80s BMW. Okay. So that's kind of working, yeah. Um, so I, I can see all of the 80s BMWs for sale, um, scroll through them. If I want to refine my search um, by selecting a different year or expanding my year range, I can open up a year refiner. And here I'm looking at all the cars, um, or all the BMWs, and this is uh, the years that they're available in. So if I click the 90s, that search is updating um, the results in real time, which is a bit hard to see on this small screen. Um, and I can drag these selectors out as well. Um, and if, every time I make a change and I'm reloading the results, um, if I go up to the URL, you can s see that uh, we're pushing a new UR URL. So at any point, if someone wants to share this on Twitter or uh, email it to their friend or whatever, you know, the URL is always correct for that. Um, and so that's quite a nice thing to have. You know, it's, uh, we're not breaking the internet. Um, the other thing is, when we go back, um, I'm able to do something kind of cool, which is just manage that transition as a client uh, thing. So I can actually just uh, see that it's a different year range and then move the handles um, uh, to that new range. So it's kind of cool that you can create this really seamless experience, but it's, you're also doing the right thing in that you're um, you know, updating the URLs and you can use it backwards and forwards and you're not breaking stuff like that. Um, so I think that's pretty much, pretty much it. If you want to, uh, uh, that car site will be at this URL at some point. At the moment, it's just an email form. So if you're into cars, you can go check your email there. Otherwise, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be around uh, today and tomorrow or Twitter. That's my Twitter thing. All right, thanks.